And uh, in my talk today, I'm going to be discussing a pilot that we did <coughs> to, uh, with DSC, some of the things we learned about it, uh, the, some of the patterns that we use at WebMD for automation and configuration as well. So I work for the part of WebMD nobody's ever heard of. We're the health services group. We have a private portal application that we sell to businesses that their employees can use to manage their health. Uh, so things like you can do benefit analysis, analysis every year to see what benefit package works for you. We have health coaching so that you can uh, work with a health coach online or over the phone to lose weight, quit smoking. We also have lifestyle improvement programs, other things to basically melt, make companies as employees healthier. I worked there for almost eight years. I'm a software arch architect, but I'm really focused on, on tools. My, my real job is to cause pain for people, is to break things and make things better. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a true believer in automation. If I can't automate something, I'm just not going to do it. If something can't be automated, I'm going to choose something else. Uh, I, uh, I'm a huge believer in automation. I've been a, I have a development background. I started work building websites in Perl, moved to PHP for several years. I, um, on the side of a full-time employment, I ran my own OS 10 server, uh, building Ruby on Rails websites, that kind of thing. Mean, meanwhile, for my full-time job, I was a .NET developer. I've been a .NET developer since version one. Uh, several years ago, I moved over and, and became a full-time tool writer for our build system and build scripts and automation. I learned PowerShell, uh, I think just after PowerShell 2 came out. Immediately after I learned PowerShell, I built a time machine went back in time and kicked my ass for not learning it sooner. Um, I'm also the creator and maintainer of an open source PowerShell module called Carbon. Carbon is focused on automating the install and configuration of Windows servers. Uh, it supports version 1.9, supports version uh, PowerShell 2, and version 2.0, which is currently in alpha, supports PowerShell 4. It has over 200 functions that you can use to configure uh, anything on top, of, on top of Windows. The most important feature in any project, in my opinion, is the documentation. I'm very proud of Carbon's documentation. Every single one of these functions is fully documented, has a synopsis, a description, has at least one example in it. We actually have a, a unit test in there that actually makes sure that before you, are, before Carbon passes all its tests, it actually has all those parts to its documentation. We write documentation in, car in Markdown, and we export that Markdown out to HTML, and uh, this is actually copy and pasted from the Carbon documentation website. This is the menu of all the functions that you can click on and get documentation for. And it's also fully tested. Uh, I use test-driven development whenever I'm writing code for it. About 95% of Carbon is tested. Every time you do a commit and you push it to, the, to its Mercurial repository, a test fires off, runs all the tests, and make sure everything, uh, we didn't break anything, have any regressions or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's a, I'm very, very proud, very proud of it. It's, unfortunately, it doesn't use Pester. It wasn't out when I, when I started this, or I didn't know about it, probably the latter. Uh, so we ha I have a homegrown unit testing firmware called Blade. It's actually out on my Bitbucket repository. You can actually download and use it. It's based off of NUnit, so you'll see a lot of assertions and things like that. Um, it's going to be quite a task to, to update the pastor, so I'm not sure if we'll ever get there. So my concern, so when you're configuring and provisioning your, your environments, at the bottom you've got your hardware, your virtual machines, and Windows is on top of that, and then you've got applications on top of that. I, I'm an application guy. I'm focused on this top layer. Websites, Windows services, users, permissions, that kind of thing. Our main application, the personal health manager, is a .NET web app. It's gargantuan. It's huge. Millions of lines of code. It all gets deployed and out together into our live environment. It takes about an hour to get it out, warmed up, compiled, and ready to go, and ready to serve traffic in a, in a timely, timely manner. We have a small service layer that, that it uses, uh, but mostly it's just one big monolithic application. Last year, one of our developers wanted to pilot a new way of doing our UI using node.js. And the advantage was that these, these UIs would be decoupled, so they wouldn't have any dependency on each other. And because it's, it's node, there's no warm-up time, it's all dynamic, 
uh, they can be developed fast and deployed even faster because we don't have to compile anything, we don't have to spin anything up or, or warm anything up. And we wanted these node UIs to exist on one server and we wanted a server to kind of service all, all these, these dis distinct independent UIs. And so the pilot concerned itself with getting this node overlord service configured. It does the routing to the individual UI services based on people's URLs. And so we decided that uh, this was about six to 12 months after DSC came out. We decided to use, to try to use DSC to get this node overlord <coughs> server configured and running. Now why anybody would choose to use JavaScript as a language in production is beyond me. JavaScript is a huge powerful language, but as you can tell, the good parts of JavaScript are very, very small. <laughs> the first thing what we, did, we wanted to do in our pilot was we wanted to do a whole end-to-end -end test. We wanted to get everything from authoring a, a, res a resource, putting it out to a pull server, and then getting the server to pull that configuration out and configure itself. We wanted to get that whole thing working as quickly as possible with the simplest amount uh, of code as possible. We chose to do a file share pull because that was simple. We didn't have to set up an IIS uh, web server pull server. And so this is the, the basically the first configuration that we had. We created a directory for Node's log files. We installed Node from its MSI package. We unarchived our own internal Node service from a zip file. And then we created a service user to run the Node service. And so we want to be able to do this in a platform, on a platform type of a way so that if anybody came along in the future, they didn't have to do, rewrite everything from scratch. And so the first thing we needed to do was, uh, after we had our resource written, and convert it to a MOF file, we need to be able to publish all this stuff out to our pull server. So we need to be able to convert our resource into a MOF file. We needed to package up this zip file and we needed to copy the MSI out. So we created a, plat a publish platform to do all this. And the publish platform reads in these JSON configuration files that tell it what to do. And so in this case, we are creating a node overlord configuration where we need to have this MSI file and we need to create this archive, this node overlord.zip archive, which includes these files and excludes these files. And so we, it, it, this published platform just goes through this file and does each thing. It looks for each item and then does it. It zips files up. The problem was with the zip files, we found out that the version of DSC we were on, it couldn't unzip files that were zipped with .NET. And we tried the .NET native libraries, we tried Ionic, uh, the open, an open source package, and neither of them would work. Things zip with the shell would work, but not with the, uh, not with anything compressed with .NET. I'm not sure, sure if that was fixed in the November update or not. Yes. Um, was it fixed? Yeah. Thank you. It was fixed, yay. Uh, but it wasn't fixed at this time, and so I wrote a function to solve the problem. And this is actually part of Carbon, it's called compress item. You give it a path, an out file, uh, and a switch on whether you want to use .NET or the shell, and it will compress the file for you. <coughs> and so I'm not sure if anybody's seen this before. You, you see this code all over the internet when you, when you search for PowerShell compressed shell. Um, and it creates a shell application object to, to compress everything. Uses the shell APIs to add files to the zip file or uses the Ionic to pay, based on how you're using it. And you'll notice there's, in the middle there, you'll see a zip item count plus equals entry count. We have to keep track of how many items we're adding to this, fu this file if we're using the shell, because the shell does things asynchronously, that's in the background, separate from your process. And so you think you're done, when in reality that zip file can't be done. So if you go to then read it out or do something with it, uh, it's locked, the shell's got it, and you're gonna get crashes. And so at the end, after we've added everything to the zip file, we actually have to sit there and wait a little while for the, for the shell to finish. And so we constantly, every, uh, ten, every tenth of a second, we open it up, make sure that the count equals what we expect it to be, and when it finally is, we know it's done. There might be a better way to do that. There might be hooks in the shell to say, hey, on, when you're done, call me back, but uh, I wasn't able to find anything. Of course, if you're using .NET or Ionic, you just save the file. Great, so now we've got our, our resources packaged up, our zip file packaged up, we've got our MOF file, well, we'll get to the MOF file later. Next, one thing we needed was that when we create a user, we need the password. 
and we can't be passing around plain text passwords. It's, it's just not secure. And so we have to use public key cr cryptography. As uh, Lee Holmes explained this morning, public, with public, cre public key cryptography, you create two keys, a public and a private. They go together. And you use the public to encrypt a secret. And the public key can only encrypt things. It can't ever decrypt them. And then you use the private key to decrypt it to get that secret back out. And so what we do is we actually have a password file. Again, you'll notice we like to use uh, PowerShell has these great convert to and from JSON commandlets. And so we stick a lot of our configuration in JSON. Uh, so we have this, we create this password file. And you can see it's broken down by environment because we might want to have different passwords in different environments. And we use public keys to encrypt the secrets or even generate random secrets that nobody even knows. And we encrypt them when we store them in, these, in this passwords file. And then when we need it, we just, ha we just open up the file, grab the password, and either send it off to where it needs to go, or if somebody has permissions, they can decrypt, they can decrypt that secret back out to plain text. Uh, and Carbon's got some great functions for doing this. We have a RS, new RSC key, key pair function, which will generate the private and public key pair for you. It requires the Windows SDK because uh, it uses MakeCert and PVK2 PFX executables to do this. If anybody knows of any uh, Win32 APIs or .NET APIs that will generate public private key pairs, come talk to me, because I would love to not have to use, depend on the Windows SDK. And uh, Carbon also has a protect string function for encrypting. It'll encrypt with the DP API, which means you don't need to manage the keys, Windows manages them for you. And you can encrypt at the user level, which means only the user can decrypt it, or you can encrypt at the computer level, which means anybody on that computer can decrypt it. Or you give it a certificate, <coughs> private key, or a path to a private key, and it will uh, encrypt with that key, and then the corresponding unprotect functions to, de to, to decrypt. All right, so now we can finally generate our MOF file. We've got all the pieces in place. So we decided on a standard where we would put all of a, uh, a we're calling it a role, so whatever that application we're configuring on that server. Whatever uh, the role needs to get itself configured on a, on a server, all, everything gets stored in a file with the name of that role. So in this case, our role is node overlord. So the file is node overlord.dsc.ps1, and that's put in a standard location in our, in our uh, source control repository. And in that file, there needs to be two things, a configuration block with the same name as our role, and then a configuration data block, or hash table, with the name that, it, that includes the name of our role as well. And this allows us to platform it so that we can have a platform that says, convert these MOF, uh, take this DSC and convert it into MOF file for, this, for these environments. And all you have to do is give it a name. And then it can go out and look up, grab the file that it needs to, uh, look introspect into the file, do some validation on it, and do some other um, things around it. And so all the developer has to do is write this file and everything else is taken care of, it for, uh, taken care of for them. And so our invoke, WHS DSC configuration is the script we use to convert mo uh, configuration into MOF files. Yes, question? Can you go back to the slide? Where are you specifying your certificates? I'll get to that. Uh, the question was where do we specify the certificates? And that's going to come up a little bit later. Yep. So invoke this function is what we use to convert our configurations into a MOF files. It just takes a name and it does all the lookups for you. Here's the code where we have a set of standard paths where we do the lookups. We find the dsc.ps1 file. Uh, if it doesn't exist, we do some uh, report that to the error. We report that to the user. We import the file. We make sure that it's got a convict data block. Uh, we can do some validation on it. Make sure that we yep, and then to make sure we have a let's see. Yeah, make sure we have a configuration data block. That's what that's doing. And then we run the configuration. We output the MOF files to a, to a known place. We pass it in the configuration data with the, that we got. And what else do we do? And then we do the rename. So in DSC, the MOF files, when you're in pull mode, have to have it be a GUID. And so then we take the host name that, that the start or the, the config DSC does, we convert that into the GUID.MOF name that DSC expects. And because I'm, we're humans and we don't speak GUID, uh, we actually put a, we actually created a set, another file, this may or may not be best practice, as Lee here, he'll probably be mad at me for doing this, but we actually create a, a key file, that's the GUID underscore, and then it tells you what the role is, what the server name is, 
and what the environment is for that file. So you don't have to open it up to figure out what's in there. You can just look on the in, in Windows Explorer to see what's there. And then we use this copy DSC resource to copy it out. Uh, and we, you may ask, why do we have copy DSC resource? I'll tell you, because you have to have checksum files out on your poll server. Every file that, well, every file, but most of the files that DSC needs have to have a check, has to have a checksum, or else it won't copy it down. So copy DSC resource takes a path, takes a destination, uh, whether or not you want to do it recursively, and it copies everything over. And if there are missing, any missing checksum files, it will generate those checksum files for you. Um, not only that, but it will only copy files that have changed. Yeah, question. Oh, yes, thank you. The question was, is this a part of carbon? Yes, this is a part of carbon. And it will only copy things that have changed, because that's faster than copying everything all the time. And so here's a little code snippet from carbon. You can see at the top there, it generates the checksum. It writes out a checksum file. It all, there's all this in a temporary location first. Then it compares the checksum from what's on the poll server. And if they're different, or if you're forcing the copy, it, uh, it copies everything out to your, to your poll server for you, both, both files. And it will also copy non-MOF uh, files. It will copy anything you want it to. You point it a path, it will copy everything over. So we also use this to copy our MSI file and our zip files out as well. All right, so we've got our MOF file generated. It's out on the poll server. Actually, everything's out on our poll server now. Now we need to get the server configured. So we have to, we have to configure the LCM on our server to be in poll mode. And wouldn't you know it, we wrote a function for it. And again, this is also part of Carbon. Initialize LCM. You can configure to be in push mode, in poll mode with a uh, IIS poll server or with a uh, file share poll server. And what it does internally is it actually just runs, there's a special configuration block for the LCM and it runs that configuration block for each, for each mode. And this is also where we tell the, the configuration block what certificate to use on that server. We pass that in as well. Um, and I believe this, this pretty much handles all the, all the configuration that you can do for an LCM with the version we have. Let's see. Ah, uh, my favorite part of this. It will actually install your private key for you. So if you give it a, a path to your private key and the password for it, it will actually copy, it'll read that file in, base64 encode it, send it as a parameter out to the, uh, do a remoting command out to the server, uh, base64 unencode it, send it out to the file system, and then use PowerShell to install your private cert into a private cert store for you, uh, which, which is very, very nice. Um, and this is, the, this is our own internal code for doing, for doing that. You can see at the top, we're reading in the password for the private key, and then we're passing that to our initialized, the initialized LCM. We should probably be doing that as a credential. Um, or, do, or did I change the code to do it that way? Um, initialized LCM should be taken in a credential instead of a, uh, a plain text password. But, all right, so our end to end is done. And it worked, it worked almost good. Uh, we'll go a little bit more. <laughs> we, had some, we had some troubles, I'll go over that in a little bit, but we had our end to end test, everything, we had it all working from the end to end. We could author resources, we could publish them out, and they would get picked up on our Node Overlord server. So now we need to expand the breadth of what we were doing. We need to get no, Node completely configured. Oh, whoops, that was too bad. Well, oh. uh, now you get the blue, the blue highlight stuff is stuff that the native Microsoft resources didn't do. So we had to configure Node.js via its INI file. We had to give set permissions on the file system. We had to grant the user privileges to log on as a service. We had to install the service. There is a native one to do that, but there's reasons we had to write our own. And we had to install some scheduled tasks. And so we wrote a bunch of resources to do all that. And all these resources, excuse me, all these resources, uh, they're all in Carbon, they're all available as part of 2. Our alpha release of 2.0. They all use native, they all, no, not native, they use other car, internal, car, not internal, they use Carbon functions to do what they need to do. They don't, so anything that these resources do, there's a Carbon function to do it if you don't want to use a resource. So if you need, if you need this function out, there are Carbon functions to do it. The first is an INI file. We need, to, we need to set a value in an INI file. So we wrote that. We needed to, let's see. We needed to set permissions. 
so on the file system. And this, this resource not only sets stuff on the file system, it'll also set registry permissions and uh, permissions on certificate private keys. If you give it a path to a certificate, cert colon backslash, it'll set permissions on private keys using actual APIs to do so. I'm very proud of that one. Uh, there's a firewall rule resource which will add, delete a firewall rule or enable or disable existing firewall rules. There's one for granting privileges. So our, because our node user, our user was running as a service, it needed the right to do so. So on Windows 2012, you have to have the batch log on right and the service log on right to do that. So there's a uh, resource to do that. We had to write our own service resource because the native one doesn't support configuring the failure actions on a service. And we have pretty strict uh, requirements on our, what a service <coughs> does if it fails. And so you can see here we have to set, we, uh, we take these, these actions on all our services and we, we have custom delays on when they restart and when they reset. And then finally our scheduled task, you can see down in the middle there, we have a resource to create scheduled tasks and under, as I said before, there's an underlying install scheduled task that this resource uses. It took me a week to write this because there's all sorts of different permutations you can do when you're writing a scheduled task, as you cannot see here because there's so many uh, that that is so small. These are all the different ways uh, that you can install a scheduled task, all the distinct ways. And by the end of the week, I was so, t I hadn't even gone to the resource by the end of the week. So by the end of the week, uh, the DSC resource just does the bottom one. <laughs> you give it a, a, a block of task XML and it'll create a uh, scheduled task with that with that ta task XML. So I alluded to earlier, you know, we did have some problems. We had some roadblocks, some, some bumps that we ran into. Um, mostly involved with our continuous deploy. When we deploy our application, we want it to, to reconfigure itself as soon as we redeploy it out. But DSC only wants to do that at most every 30 minutes. It will only run a configuration check every 30 minutes. You can force it. There's a way to force it with WMI, but we found that it only, it only worked every, every other time. The first time we tried to force it, it wouldn't do anything, and then the second time it would actually do something. So that, that kind of made us scratch our heads. I'm not sure if that's fixed in the November update or not. We also encountered the problem where if you, as we iterate on this, we had new versions of Carbon for every, every time we had one of these new resources. And the LCM, um, it's supposed to delete the old version and install a new one, but we found that it wouldn't do that, it actually failed. It, it creates temp directories when it updates the new one but it doesn't delete them. And so the next time it goes to update it, it leaves, it, there's something there and it fails. That has been fixed in the November update from what I've heard. And then I talked about earlier about the problems with decompressing zip files. And then one fun little problem we had was with the installer. The LCM runs as system. And so when you run an installer as system, if that installer does user specific things, surprise, surprise, all the paths that it sets up are for system which are in Windows, City Windows somewhere. I can't remember. But our service user doesn't have permission to write and read from those locations, and so Node failed. And so after posting something very useful, a uh, question on the PowerShell.org forums, uh, I was able to figure out that there's this all users equals one flag that I could pass to this installer. I'm not sure if that's a generic installer thing or if it's just specific to, uh, to Node. I think it might be a generic thing. This instructed MSI to install for all users, so all the application paths and temporary directories were all set somewhere where our node user could actually, could actually get there. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about configuration and not the DSC, and we'll take a little bit of a detour off of DSC, and not the configuration as DSC knows it, but the configuration as, as more like config files and how are things, um, what settings are things using. And I'm going to talk a little about some of the patterns that we use at WebMD around this. And so the first pattern is we use the same automation platform in all our environments. And that includes developer workstations. The same code that we use um, on our, in our dev environment to configure it is the same that the developers run on their machines when they want to get the application configured. And we're currently working on getting that expanded to our other environments. Um, and we do this because it reduces duplication. If you have one system where you're configuring stuff over here in live and production, but another system over here, that's a lot of duplication. And if you fix a bug over here, you might not have fixed it over in, in the, another environment. 
And also, part of DevOps is that, you're, that developers are sharing the responsibility for getting your, their applications configured. They're not just throwing it over the wall to operations to get it configured in the live environments. And so when you're using the same platform, the developers have a, they're better able to dig into that code and get things, uh, get a first pass of things written. So if there's a new web service, they can run it, jump in and, and type up the code to get that, the, the basic framework for that web service installed. And then when it gets to operations, they can add the operational pieces to it. Uh, yes. So, one of the things that we did during our pilot was we we wanted to make sure that DS we could run the same DSC configuration on developers' local computers. And you can. The problem is because it's a the problem we ran into is because the LCM runs as a separate process. Any modules you use in your resources has to be available to the LCM. Well, when you're configuring applications, everything's usually checked into a source control repository, and everything that you need to to configure yourself is checked in as well. And you might have a dozen applications that are using a dozen different versions of the same module. And from what I understand, you can't have different versions of modules installed in a PowerShell's module pass. It's one version or nothing. And so what we have to do, if, I don't know, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Fixed. Is that <coughs> fixed? Oh, you, I love you. <laughs> um, I, I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to that feature. And so on our developer machines, we don't install our modules in PS module paths. All our setup stuff, it actually loads the module from inside the repository. So to get DSC to work, what we have to do is we have some pre and post steps. Pre, we have to look at all the modules that we're going to be using, and we have to, we create junctions into the PowerShell module paths so that the LCM can find them. We run our DSC, it finds the modules, it finishes, and then we uninstall those junctions, hopefully. <laughs> um, so that's how we got it to work on developer computers. It actually worked, uh, worked pretty good. Uh, pattern number two that we use is, and we're not quite here yet, I'll admit, we're, this, is, this is where we're currently working for, is that you package up your application and the code used to set it up together and they get deployed together. They, they, they move through your, your software lifecycle together. So when you deploy an application out to a server, you're deploying not only the code, but the code needed to set it up. And your whatever is out there on the server, there should be some kind of agent or some process that actually <coughs> notices, oh hey, there's a new code out here. I'm gonna reconfigure my application. So if you have a new, if you have a website and you've added a new virtual directory, when you deploy the code out to a server, boom, the new vir virtual directory shows up because the setup code runs at deploy time. And this, kind of, this leads us to uh, pattern number three, where we separate the, the setup code from the configuration that it uses. And this is better easy to explain by showing an example of an anti-pattern. This is what I call the switch anti-pattern. I'm sure we've all seen this. I've seen this in actual application code, setup code, is you see this, if I'm in this environment, do this. If I'm in this environment, do this. If I'm in this environment, do this. This does not scale. Because usually this gets repeated across your application or across your setup scripts. And so if you have to add a new environment, what do you have to do? You have to go search all your code and look for everywhere that's using the switch anti-pattern. And that is not easy to do, because some places, they may only do a custom thing for one environment. Uh, they may not do, they might, they might not have a full switch statement, so it's very hard to add new environments. It's also really hard to test because you can't test production without being in production because production is production specific things and you can't test that unless you're in production. It's, it's kind of a catch 22. It's really hard to test separate environments without being in that environment. And so what we use is what I call the configuration store pattern is that you put your configuration in a store somewhere and then you pull it out for whatever environment you need. So you can see here at the top here, we have some bindings and the path of web root. We pull that from our store. And then we use that to configure our website and uh, whether or not we want to enable debugging on this machine. And this makes testing way, way easier because when you want to test that this works, you just set up a test environment with custom bindings, a custom web root. You run it through, you look when it's done, did I get my custom binder, or custom web root? Then you know that it pu it's pulling the right configuration from the store. And at where we're at, we actually use a hierarchical store. We, we developed a, a hierarchical configuration store where we can inherit settings from other environments. So you can see it looks like a tree like this. So at the root, you'll have a set of default settings and then your different environments and those can have different environments. Uh, and here's an example. We store it as a hash table. 
Uh, and inside the hash table are many hash tables for each environment. So you can see at the top we have default, and then we have dev environment, which inherits from dev, which, which inherits from default, and then developer, which inherits from dev. And so when we need a setting, we say, oh, I want, uh, I want the bindings for, let's say, I want the web root for test. Uh, and here's the code that actually does that. But it looks, so it looks at the test environment and says, well, there's no web root here, but I inherit for I, oh, that's, that's a code problem. That's a bug. Um, it's supposed to say uh, default. But I inherit from default, so I'm going to go look up in default. Oh, look, there's a web root here. I'm going I'm to use that setting. And this bit, yes. So when you do this versus use configuration data? I will, I will get there. I'm gonna, I will tie it together. Um, mostly because this existed before we got to DSC. So this is what we're using before. This is actually inspired by DSC. To be, when I first saw DSC, and I saw that they, we, they were doing all nodes, I was like, oh, you saved my life. Uh, and and we, we started to roll this out. We still have the old way of doing things, but um, I'll tie this back to DSC in a, in, in a little bit. Um, and it's really easy to, to create a new environment because you just add a new mini hash table. You choose what environment you want to inherit from and just change what's, what's different. Now, there are some cons that you have to be, you have to be aware of um, what you're inheriting from. If you're adding a setting to an environment that's being inherited by something else, you have to make sure you're not going to screw up that environment by uh, using a setting that, that would, wouldn't work there. Uh, also, this can get really big. In our main application, we have a, an environments hash that's about, I think, 1, 1,500 lines long. It's really, really big. But it's much better than the statement, the switch statement. And here's our code that actually, oh, and one more thing we, we actually added, is you can have machine-specific overrides with this. So in this example, you see, if you look at the production environment, you'll see there's an int prod debug subhash where we've enabled debugging. So maybe there's one server we want to have verbose logging on or some different, some server in live we want a little bit different. And this is how we would do it. And when we look up our setting, um, the first thing we do here is let's look at our environment. And if there's a, a, a sub hash for my computer that I'm on, you look at, let's look in those settings first. And then we'll look in my environment. And then we'll do the recursive lookup up to the top of the inheritance tree. So it allows it to be really flexible. We can have environments that inherit from other environments, and we have machine-specific overrides. It's been very, very useful. So back to DSC, and we'll answer Jeffrey's question. So this is, uh, I showed this, this code earlier, and one of the top's a little bit new, but you can see there's a lot of variables that we're using to determine what we want to do. So on developer machines, we don't need to install the node overload service from archive because it's stored in the source. So we have a switch to exclude that resource on developer machines. Well, where does that switch come from? It comes from one of these, these hashes. And this is how we hook it up to DSC. So we have this. Here's the all nodes. Everybody's familiar with this, right? We have this all nodes at the top. And we have this git WHS DSC node config data function. And this is where the, the private certificates come in, right? This, this one does the lookup for a machine in an environment to figure out what private key to use. And this function actually returns a, a, a hash table that contains the environment the machine's in, the machine name, it's, and its private key information. And it might be, it might be some other information. And then just after that is where we have our, this is our WebMD specific environments hash table. So this is where we stick the, the hierarchical config data that we have. And later on, if you look in, your, in, our, in, our, in, your config, in our config block, you'll see this at the very top before we get to the resources. This is where we pull out all the configuration that we're going to use uh, for the whatever environment. So as you can see at the top, for each node that we've got in our all nodes, we're going to grab the environment. And remember, we set the environment up here. This, this function returns the environment for the computer. So we're grabbing the environment for the computer, and then we're pulling out all its settings. Uh, and then we use those later on to do things like conditionally add a resource, you can see down here the scheduled tasks. We're looping over the scheduled tasks for an environment and adding only those scheduled tasks for each environment. Like in dev, we don't have any scheduled tasks. We don't need to run any maintenance at night. But if you look down here, um, there's a default set of tasks for at the top. But the test actually has a slightly different scheduled tasks than our main live environment does. Um, 
So you, you may have noticed some duplication, or what looks like duplication in our config data store. And our pattern number four is duplication is okay. And now if there are any developers here, it's okay. Take a deep breath. I know as a developer, we're taught duplication is bad. You don't want duplication. Um, but I'm going to explain what I mean. Here's an example of, of the way we used to do things. And this is, this is from my own personal experience. You have this config option called internal service URL. And you're constructing it from the app name. Uh, because you noticed in all your config that, hey, this app1 string that we're using, it's duplicated in a lot of places. I don't want that duplication. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refactor that out into a variable and then reuse that variable. The problem is that app name now becomes a global variable. And when you have global variable, people can start using those without your knowledge or consent. And then suddenly that app name gets used in paths, it, use, it gets used over here. And then if you want to change app name to Zot, now you can't just do that because you have to go through all the code and find all the places that app name is used and make sure that it's okay to change the name to Zot. And this is all, I, also, I like to call this string math. Um, and when, you, when you're dealing with configuration, I don't, I, I, it, to me, string math is a, it's a code smell. It means I'm not doing something right. And so we've adopted the pattern where we just, just pull it from config. Don't, don't string math it. Just pull the value from, from your config files. Do this, and we, I, I try to encourage developers to do this actually in their applications too. You see a lot of string math in application code, not necessarily even setup code. And I, I encourage people, just pull it. Don't, don't do this string math because you actually don't need to do it. Just pull it from configuration because you're actually not duplicating it. Because what you don't want to duplicate is the concept that's being represented, not necessarily the string. The string is just a string. What you don't want to duplicate is the concept. And I'll give an example here. So here again, you see one of our hierarchical config stores. And if you're looking closely, you may notice duplication, or what looks like duplication. But it really isn't. Even though it also, the, uh, these all say at one, they actually represent two different concepts. One is the path to the web root, and the other is the bindings for the website. They may have things in common between them, but they're different concepts. And it's OK to duplicate strings inside concepts. It, it, does, does that make sense? And so we've moved away from string math and, and, and we, we try not to duplicate concepts. Another pattern you'll see are functions that construct, again, do string math to construct con a configuration value. So in this contrived example, we have this function, hey, get my app URL. And we're constructing it based on the environment. And then our code, we say, hey, get, give me the app URL. This seems like a pretty good idea. You're, you've got code that's that's, you've abstracted that, so all you need is the environment, and it returns you the URL that you want. Um, the problem is, when it comes to configuration values, there are always exceptions. Uh, you may not have an exception today. You may not have an exception tomorrow. Uh, but eventually, you'll get something that quacks like a duck, but isn't a duck. Um, and all your carefully constructed code to do this, you're gonna have to now go through and add an exception to this code that constructs it because you've got a new environment that doesn't follow this pattern. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so, again, here's another example. Just pull it from config because that, the, although it's good to have conventions, it's good for your topology to have conventions. Uh, I'm sure we all have, we've all seen this kind of convention where you have your DNS set up and it's, it's very uh, structured and organized and your topology has a convention and a pattern. Um, but you don't necessarily need to encode that in your code. And I have a really good example. Again, I hope Lee's not here because he's really going to be mad at this next one. Um, and I actually, I, I did this myself before I realized it, is I don't speak GUID. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to be really clever. And I wanted to be able to, rec to learn to recognize our GUIDs. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to take our role name for our applications. I wanted to take the environment name and the server name. And I wanted to use those to construct a GUID. And I thought, oh, I'm being so clever. We'll learn to recognize that the first part of the SKUID means the environment, the second part means the role, and the third part means the machine name. And I wrote this, I spent a day writing this code, and then I realized, I just pull it from config. I don't need all this code. Because now I have to test it, I have to maintain it. Uh, if there's ever an exception, I have to then encode the exception. It was just wasted effort, because I could just pull, I'll pull a stick and GUID from the config. I, don't, I didn't need to do all this, all this extra work. 
So what did we learn? What did we learn from our, from our pilot? Uh, I'm glad Jeffrey said it, Jeffrey Snow said it, said it yesterday. We learned that DSD was uh, at a point nine. <laughs> we learned there were some rough edges. It was, it's great technology, we loved it. It does some really cool things, but it was point nine. We had some rough edges. Um, we were able to fit our patterns on top of it pretty easily. We were actually inspired to adopt some patterns from it. Um, but at the end, we kind of felt like we were fighting its design. Um, and we determined that it's good for provisioning servers, but it's not so good for provisioning applications. And there's a subtle, subtle difference there. DSC is really, it seems, it seems to be that it's designed to provision a server. And what makes me say that is that there's a 30 minute window where it wants to recheck its configuration. And you can force it, but I don't really think that's a part of an accepted DSC pattern. You really want the computer to just reconfigure itself every 30, 60, however long you want. But it won't do it more than 30 minutes. That's not good when you're deploying an application and you want, instant re 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 you want to instantly reapply that application's configuration on demand. DSC isn't necessarily an on-demand kind of a thing. And when I looked at the resource ways as they were coming out, there's lots of really cool features. We think it is. And what was that? We think so. You know, that, that kind of 30 minute check, that's just sort of like if you're not doing something. Mm -hmm. But we, we sort of designed it, it's totally fine to just say, make it this way now. And that's especially for the push servers. Because you know, in configuration you can say, apply, right. or apply and monitor, or apply and correct. So you can just uh, you know, do apply and monitor, and then correct whenever you want. Right, it, it will work, you can, yeah, I'm, I'm, you can make it work. Yeah. Um, and if we wanted to, we could make it work. And I also noticed, um, I got another slide that'll kind of address that a little bit. Um, we also noticed that the resource waves that were coming out, they were at a different level than what we needed. Uh, I noticed that at all the resource waves, there was very little duplication between our automation platform that configures our applications between the two. Uh, that we actually had a lot of stuff that, the, that we still had to write DSC resources for that weren't coming out of Microsoft. And it just kind of seemed, it just kind of seemed to, to tell the tale that it's really for provisioning servers. Um, and so pattern number five, and this might be a little controversial and that's okay, is that you, for us, we, we want to separate what happens at the server level to provision the server and what happens at the application level to configure the applications. Because you have way more variability in your applications than you do in your servers. So that's what this slide shows is that you might have web server, that for DSC, they all get set up the same, but you might have dozens of different applications on those servers um, that you can, that, that are running, that, that all get configured slightly differently. And you might have a file server, you might have uh, services that run Windows services or other kind of command line applications that are also running different things. And so the deploy tool could be a lot of different things. Um, you could use PowerShell Remote to do it. You could even use DSC to do it. I don't know, does DSC support being able to have a server that's configured for pull mode and then push in a, a standalone configuration to it? Does, it, does DSC support that? What was that? They were chatting about that. We were talking about your general talk. What, what was the question? Does DSC support, if I have a server in pull mode, can I push a standalone configuration to it? Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it, then it pushes. So if it's in pull mode, you can push by doing dash force, but once you push, then it's in push mode, you have to set it back to pull mode. Okay. So you could do it. So you could use, you could, you could use DSC to, at deploy time, deploy your code and then reconfigure your application. Um, there's also a lot of third party tools that you can use. We're currently investigating uDeploy. And these third party tools, they actually have agents that sit on the server that handle not only deploying all your code out, uh, but then we'll run, we'll actually configure the code and run PowerShell scripts and do that kind of thing. And so this is kind of the pattern that we're going to be leading towards uh, at WebMD is being able to provision servers with, the, with uh, we're actually investigating Chef as a next step um, to do our server provisioning and then uh, continue to use PowerShell and uh, choosing some kind of deploy tool to run our, our application. Uh, there's tools like RepoWeb, uDeploy, BuildMaster, they all, they all have agents that run on your servers that handle deploying things and then running scripts and things to get them configured. So do you think there's a difference though between application deployment and application configuration? So, so, so we have a... Uh, We've run into a lot of issues where um, we have uh, 
we have configuration files that will get updated manually, and that causes a lot of problems. So what we, what we do with DSC is we implement those configuration changes through, well, you know, use DSC to implement those configuration changes. So if you need to change that config, you just use DSC to do that. Um, and that's where a lot of those, um, it, you have you get so many examples of, of uh, you know, spending days or, or hours you know, troubleshooting those problems and those, those go away. Yeah, we, all, we do all our configs up, up front. Um, so we have separate configs for each environment, but um, yeah, that's one way, to, one way to solve it. So here's my contact information, um, my personal stuff up at the top, my Bitbucket repository. At the bottom, if you're interested in Carbon, uh, I have a specific Twitter account for that and a blog that tracks changes, and then there's the, the Carbon website. Uh, if you have any more questions, we're, we're, I'm out of time, so um, hit me up after, afterwards, and, uh, and we'll talk and debate, and I will show that you are wrong. <laughs> Thank you for your time. So, Ed and I have uh, one question. Have you played with the DSC version 2 or version V5? Have I what? Have you looked at DSC V5?